welcome to episode 31. So we're on now season four of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest was born and raised in Tokyo and attended the Christian Academy in Japan, CAJ, from K through 12. After receiving a degree in intercultural studies and a minor in TESOL from Emmaus Bible College, he returned to Japan and worked several months in the headquarters of CRASH, Christian Relief Assistance Support Help, during the initial months of the Tohoku disaster relief work. Later that same year, he moved to Gifu, where he moved, where he worked five years in the Japanese public school as an English teacher while doing missionary work on the side. Since 2016, he has begun working as a full-time missionary in the Tokai region while still based in Gifu. He is part of a network called No Place Left that seeks to empower Japanese Christians to take the message of Jesus to their own circles of influence until all have had a chance to hear. He is currently still living in Gifu City with his wife, Amy, and his two sons. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Caleb. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so, good to be able to, able to be on. Well, great to see you. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about your work as well as I want to delve in a bit more into the school, CAJ. We've had a few people on from CAJ, Nate Reasoner, um, uh, just last episode, Moby Fair. But you're like a CAJ lifer, right? You've been there K through 12. <laughs> Pretty much. So you, you've seen you've seen it from the beginning to the end, and uh, so yeah, we'll get into that a bit towards the end of the podcast. But first, right. um, I want to jump right into what you were doing uh, d- post Tohoku earthquake. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned in the bio about working with Crash. So can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah. So my wife and I were living in Tokyo uh, when the the big earthquake hit. Um, I was doing a little brush up Japanese side stuff, dropped that, banded together with a bunch of other missionaries that were called together. Uh, There's a a missionary that put together a crash and as a means of Christians and churches being able to get right into the relief work. So he called a meeting saying, hey, any of you that's available, come to a meeting. We need to decide how are we going to respond. So I was at that meeting and I was thinking, all right, how can, you know, maybe I can empty garbage, you know, buckets and serve people. And, you know, I don't think I have much to, to add. And the same guy is like, Hey, I, we need you to help out. So next thing I know, I'm helping with uh, Intel. I'm like, what in the world? Um, mm-hmm. So basically gathering information from up in the Tohoku area, sending people up, finding out where's safe, where's not safe, where can we establish a base? So we established five bases throughout the Tohoku region and we would send teams of volunteers from uh, United States, Canada, Europe, different places that were coming saying, we wanna help, how can we help? We'd put them into teams, get them prepped, get them kind of knowledge about where they're going, what they're gonna be doing, um, how to be safe, uh, and then send them to the bases. And then from the bases, they'd be, uh, they would go off to different churches and those churches would send them into specific jobs in their community. So it was kind of a, piecemeal you know section by section so i was based completely in in the tokyo i never actually got to go up but just kind of helping yeah helping get the groundwork so that others can go up and do the. so when it came to sort of putting together that team you mentioned there are various churches so i'm curious when it comes to these like operations that are run by christian organizations there's obviously different denominations to what extent are they sort of denomination based or are they very sort of inclusive in regards to the various sectors of Christianity? Yeah, good question. Um, there's a, a, an association Japan wide called JEA Japan Evangelical Association. And so that was mainly the, uh, the pool that they were drawing from um, the majority of evangelical churches so there's definitely some overlap. There's definitely some, uh, we can work with, you know, people a little bit outside of that, uh, primarily working with that. And so, again, that was both from gathering from churches from across Japan that were unaffected, who wanted to get in and help, as well as the churches that we were working through um, up in the Tohoku region. So again, it's kind of a wanting to, uh, how about in the places wh- that are falling through the cracks? So like the big cities, the big, you know, infrastructure stuff got help from the government, but there's a lot of small towns or little people here and there in neighborhoods that were not get, you know, getting overlooked simply because the immensity of the problem. And that's where the local churches in that area 
knew what, where those needs were. And so, so that was kind of, I don't know if that answered the question, but that's kind of how that worked. That's interesting. And um, speaking of local churches, one thing that I'm sort of curious to hear from you about is sure. the population of, you know, Christians in Japan obviously are not as high as the United States or, you know, where I currently reside in Korea. So right. that community of sort of Christians, how has that changed in the past few decades, if at all? Like, has there been an increase in Christians, a decrease? Um, what has sort of been your perspective being in Japan now for 30 plus years? Yeah, good question. Uh, the short answer to that is uh, the change has actually been on the whole a decline, uh, which is hard to believe when there's already such a, a small percentage of Christians to begin with. Um, but if anything, it's been declining, um, kind of similar to the overall population decline in Japan. Uh, mm. A lot of that, uh, there's a lot of, uh, Japan has changed and the churches have not changed with it. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking very broadly. So obviously there's churches that have, there's churches that are flourishing, there's churches that are doing great, but there's a lot of dying churches. A lot of it is, uh, a lot of people who had come become Christians in the post-war era and either their children didn't join them in their faith or just a few of them did. And so you've got a lot of aging churches, average age of like 60 pastors. I think the average age for a pastor is pretty close, closer to 70. Um, there's a lot of pastor-less churches. And so there's, there's a, these sort of dynamics uh, across, across the nation. So there's, there's that aspect. At the same time, there's a growing, uh, a growing acknowledgement among a lot of Christians and churches of something needs to change. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot, um, those that I'm working with, as well as others saying, we are sensing a change in the atmosphere. There's a change uh, in the attitude of, of Christians and churches. There's, an, uh, there's a change even just in those who are not Christian among the Japanese of an interest of, oh, I'd like to know more about, about Jesus, or I'd like to know more about Christianity, or they have a very positive view of Christianity. Just one brief example, one, one gal that, that uh, my wife and I were discipling moved to another town in Gifu, and uh, she, um, she led an older lady to faith in Jesus. The way she met this, this person, this lady was having trouble in her marriage, she went to the church, first time to ever step foot in a church, knew nothing about Jesus, never read the Bible, but she just knew the church was a place of peace. So she mm -hmm. went there, met this gal that we're discipling, who then shared with her about Jesus. And the lady said, I want to follow Jesus, like on the spot. And that was something that we never heard of growing up. It's like, oh, no, it's going to take 10, 15, 20 years of slowly working mm -hmm. with someone. But now we're seeing people who out of the blue are saying, I want this. Or, or at, at the very least, a matter of weeks, months, you know, at most, maybe a couple of years, but definitely at a shorter pace than before. So when you say that churches need to change, I'm getting the impression that you're kind of maybe inferring to how the U churches in the U.S. are very different, even from when we were teenagers, right? I feel like yep. a lot has changed, especially maybe like, uh, for example, the perspectives in regards to LGBTQ plus groups. Is that the type of the change that you're inferring to, or are you talking about uh, other changes? Yeah, good question. Um, obviously, those changes are happening, um, but that's not what I was referring to. The kind of changes when I say the church needs to change, um, one simple way would be young, young Japanese, if they come into a church, they're going to see, they're going to ha come into an atmosphere that is very solemn, um, very... Uh, very slow paced, very attuned to a uh, previous generation that valued that in a way that the younger generation doesn't. Um, and so if a church is using a lot, of, there's a lot of uh, song books that are used a very old style of Japanese that people will sing the song and say, I have no idea what it's saying. They can't even understand the words. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that needs to be changed. Just the fact of technology changing, but a lot of the churches using the same traditional means of trying to reach out, uh, sharing the gospel to people in a, in a traditional way of saying, come to this event, or we've got this, or we've got a, you know, try to do like, kind of like trying to do some of these tent meetings that would happen uh, with Billy Graham. Uh, that might not, 
be the best way to reach people now, whereas now social media would be a great way to connect with people, do a meet, you know, using meetup or uh, things like that, that connect a lot more to, to the generation of now. But if the church is not able to make that adjustment, they're not going to know how to touch the people where they're at and actually so that people can go, oh, you, you're reaching me where I'm at. You're, you're understanding me. You're, you're trying to understand me instead of making me try to just force me into something that, I, that is very foreign to me. Interesting. So that the basic age or the base age is so high. So you're just saying stuff like just simple stuff like tech literacy and using more there's, updated there's some of those. methods. Sure. Yeah. But um, one other factor, and this is this has a lot to do with the type of work that I do as well, is a lot of the churches in Japan right now. And I and I say this um, kind of a, a loving criticism because I love the church in Japan. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. And and I and I value and I love them. But that's there's still things that need to change. One of those things that's a lot of the church in Japan is based upon a, an American style church and and upon American style church of a hundred years ago or fifty mm-hmm. years ago. One of the things in the Bible, Jesus says, make disciples. So teach them not just to to follow a particular head, but teach them how to do how to follow me and then how to teach someone else how to follow me and then to teach someone else. So putting the power in the hands of the Japanese rather than in the hands of just the pastor or just the missionary. Uh, my job as a missionary is to work myself out of a job. And so hmm. a lot of what we're trying to see happen is saying, hey, every single Japanese Christian, you actually have the ability to be able to go share the gospel with your neighbor or with your coworker and in a way more natural way than I could as a missionary. So I'm just hmm. giving you simple tools, simple ways to implement that. And you make it Japanese, but here's a simple way to get started. And then if that person becomes a Christian, well, how do, you, how do you help them grow as a Christian? Well, instead of just always just handing them over to the pastor, you can actually do that. Jesus has given you the authority to do that, and I want to help you do that. Here are some simple ways you can implement that. And then in the process, there's, of course, we need leaders. So how do you develop leaders? So well, here's a simple way. So all of a sudden now the potential for any Joe Blow Christian in Japan, whether they be a Saturday man or whether they, uh, whether they be a full-time pastor, knows how to share their, their, the story of Jesus with someone, how to help that person grow as a Christian, and some of those will even grow into being leaders. So that's, that's one of those things that needs to change, is to empower every Christian and to empower the churches to multiply themselves and take it themselves, own it for themselves instead of being dependent on the missionary or dependent on the pastor to do all the work. And, and I think that's a good segue, or may, maybe you've already explained quite a bit of what you do with no place left. Is that mm-hmm. basically um, sort of core values that you were just talking about in regards to empowering people? And is yep. there anything else you'd like to add in regards to no place left? So is this just, is this a network within the church or is this like a NGO, NPO? Like how do you guys yeah, operate? Yeah. yeah. So uh, no place left actually is, it's a very loose network. Um, so we're, uh, we're not an organization. There's no, there's no top. There's no, it's really, it's more of a shared vision rather than anything else. So a lot of the people I work with um, are across the board in different denominations. Um, there's some Baptists, Lutherans, um, some Pentecostals, non-denominational churches. So there's quite a variety uh, of people, but they have the same passion, same drive, same vision that they're seeing from the Bible. Of, they, I read the Bible. This is what I see God wanting. This is the, the method and the strategy that Jesus used himself. And we just want to rediscover that and implement that um, here in Japan. So this is something that in many other countries um, has really taken off to see something we call kind of church planting movement, where in a span of a very short few years, just a massive multiplication growth of, of Christians and churches. And just the belief that we believe that God hasn't changed and the same thing can happen. God wants to make that happen in Japan. And so just kind of standing on promises that God's given in the Bible and looking at the life of Jesus, looking at the life of, of Paul and other apostles and say, we want to learn from them, implement the same things. And what we see them doing is doing the work themselves. They ministered to people. They, they, they healed people. They ministered and helped people. 
they proclaimed uh, the play, proclaimed the gospel, proclaimed God's kingdom, and and then they empowered people to go and do the same thing. So it was always giving it away, give it away, give it away, instead of trying to keep it for themselves. Um, so no place left is basically until there's no place left that has not heard about Jesus Christ. Until there's no place left for me as a missionary to work because the Japanese have so owned it themselves that they don't really need me. I'm just kind of, I'm just helping them along now, but they, they've got it. They're running with it. They know what to do. They know how to do it. They've owned it. They've, they've taken it to whole new levels that I could never have imagined as a foreigner, even despite growing up in Japan. Being in Gifu, where uh, very, uh, one of the even, even fewer people, uh, percentage of, of Christians uh, than other parts, certainly than compared to like Tokyo or Osaka, and um, so a lot of my work is direct interaction with, with those who are not Christians, um, minis- you know, just seeking to bless them, seeking to help them, see who, is there anyone who's interested in knowing about Jesus? And if there's even a slight interest, and it's like, hey, I'll, I'll go as far as they're willing to go. And so if they're like, no, I'm not interested, okay, that's great, let me bless you. Uh, but if there's interest, I want to I wanna share. Um, and so kind of as it were, uh, from ground zero, as it were, uh, engaging with people, sharing those that want to know more. I share more. Those that want to follow Jesus, I begin to, to just like I said, empowering them to how to grow in their own relationship with Jesus, but then also how to go and do the same thing themselves. So simultaneously as kind of doing the, the work myself, as it were, um, visiting what churches there are, uh, not just in the Gifu area, but in the Tokai region of Aichi, Mie, and, and Shizuoka, and just engaging with pastors and just saying, hey, what's, what's your heart? What's your vision? How can I come alongside? How can I bless you? This is my vision. Uh, this is what I'm reaching for. Is there anything that, that you've heard from me that you would like to know more about? Is there any way that I can help empower your church to do more? Um, and the, kind of the same approach. If they're like, no, we're good. And it's like, great, God bless you. But if they're like, wow, that's great. Can you come and teach us more? Could you come and do a little seminar or training? So I'll go as far as the churches want. So with with your work, you're mentioning you go to Aichi, Mie, and you know, you you grew up in the uh, more or less Higashikurume. I, it's, it's Tokyo, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's west, west of very, Tokyo. Very, very edge of Tokyo, <laughs> right near Taitama, yeah. It's similar to me. I was we're outside of the twenty three wars. We're technically Tokyo, right? But you're right. mentioning, you know, there's less people in those areas, like Gifu, less than half a million. Um, living in those areas, you mentioned, so obviously fewer people of Christian Christianity. Yeah. So when your day to day operations, you mentioned, you know, you go to different churches. How much of it is also just visiting people and like basically like going from house to house, or like kind of like the Mormons do? I guess the sure. question was, do you do that? And secondly, yeah. if you yeah. do do that, uh, yeah. what is that experience like? So I'm, I imagine it's, it's, it's a tough sale, right? Because you're not selling just like, a, like an item, right? You're selling yeah. right. a pretty right. big you know, idea. So um, yeah. Yeah, how, how has that been for the past yeah. four years? Um, definitely, there's a lot of that. Um, like you said, um, there's only so many churches to go around to. Either there's more in Aichi, but that's, again, that's farther away too. So mostly I just as I get opportunities, but in the, in, in the area here in Gifu, definitely a lot of it is just simply right up, straight up interaction with people. Yes, I'll do some door to door. I don't usually go ringing the doorbell, uh, or if I do, it's just a little bit different. One of the ways that I'll do is I'll kind of go ring the doorbell. If it's a neighbor I haven't met before, it's like, hey, I want to introduce you, you know, myself to you, I'm a neighbor. And uh, one of the things I'll do a lot is I'll walk through the neighborhoods, just praying. Early in the morning, I'll just go around, praying over the neighborhoods. And so I can genuinely say, I've been praying for the neighborhood. I want to pray specifically for you. Is there anything I can pray about for you? And so that's kind of one of those um, doors. And if they're like, nope, I don't want anything. Um, Sometimes I'll get the, I'm Buddhist, no thank you. And so for me, I take that as, okay, I'm going to keep going because there's, Gifu City alone is 400,000. So rather than try to you know, knock my head against a, you know, a stone wall when someone doesn't want it, they don't want it. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep going and looking for someone who does want it. Some of the way it, there's such a variety, to be honest, some of the best interactions that I have happen as I just live life. Um, so mm-hmm. a lot of my reaching out to people is being a very intentional, intentional living. So 
if I go to a coffee shop, I don't just go to a coffee shop. I go to a coffee shop. I'm asking God, can you lead me to the people that you've already prepared their hearts to be hungry for this and want this? And mm-hmm. then I just go and I, I see someone, I say hi, and I try to go one step further. In Japan, it's very typical to just aisatsu, just to say hi, and that's enough. So I just try to take one step further and say, do they reciprocate in kind? Um, mm-hmm. And if they don't, I stop there. But if they reciprocate in kind and we end up in a conversation, it doesn't take long before naturally, just because it's, it's such a big part of who I am, you know, my, my relationship with Jesus and, and what I'm doing. Or they say, why are you in Gifu? Or they find out I live in, I grew up in Tokyo. Well, why are you now in Gifu? No one comes from Tokyo to Gifu. And so I say, well, let me tell you about that. And then I can share my story. And so there's a lot of, that's a lot of how my interactions first start. Um, sometimes it's just as I'm praying through the neighborhood, I meet someone and mm. uh, there, and then we just start a conversation. So it's kind of intentionally seeking natural opportunities, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I think you, you actually just brought into light a question I was going to get to. Sure. Why, why Yifu? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so trying to keep it short there. When I went off, I went off to uh, Bible college because I had no idea what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I thought I love Jesus, so I might as well go to a Bible college since I don't know what I want to do. And while I was there, I just started having a burning passion to come back to Japan. And I started praying through every prefecture of Japan, uh, just one by one. Um, so I'd pick one prefecture, pray for it for a couple of days, and pick another one, pray through it. And when I started praying for Gifu, just something grabbed me. It was just like inside me. I just knew my heart started breaking for, for, for Gifu. And mm. I just, I didn't even know where it was on the map. Um, I was just like, Gifu, was that Guma? You know, it's just, and I looked yeah. like, no, it's down here. Um, and so from that point, I knew, I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know what I would even be doing. I just know. God wants me in Gifu at some point. Several, you know, number of years later, uh, God opened the door and that door was teaching English in the public school in Gifu of all places. That was where I was actually being invited, asked to mm. come. And it was in Gifu. And so I thought, okay, here, here's the open way from the Lord. So really the short answer is God led me to, to Gifu and he put, a, he put a passion and love for the people in Gifu before I even knew where, where Gifu was located. So, so Gifu is a, a long-term plan then for you. You, you, you probably pretty much. Probably so I think for my wife and I, it's a, uh, until God clearly leads us somewhere else, we know this is where we're supposed to be. Interesting. And you were mentioning earlier Bible college. Um, I, I'm not religious at all. So can you maybe explain just for a few minutes, what exactly sure. is the difference between a Bible college and like a, a four-year college, or is it the same thing, but it's just what you study closer to the second. So, uh, Bible college, we have regular degrees. There's people coming away. My, my younger brother went to the same college. He came away with an elementary, deg- um, uh, elementary teaching degree uh, with an Iowa teaching license, which from what I hear is um, pretty highly respected in the United States. There's uh, people come away with a nursing degree. They get their undergraduate at the Bible college and then get some of their uh, nursing degrees at a nearby university. Uh, so there's a variety of different, uh, mine was intercultural studies and then a minor of, of TESOL. And, um, but the first year, every student goes through uh, a lot of Bible classes as part of their, I forget what it was called, but basically those, those first freshman year classes, a lot of them. So it would be like an Old Testament survey, a New Testament survey. Um, so just kind of getting more acquainted with the Bible. And then there is a specific degree that is theology. And so for those mm-hmm. who want to go on into something more of a, of a, a pastoral role, um, role in the future or something like that, or Bible translation, um, they, have, they have that option. And then mm-hmm. for anyone who is taking whatever degree, but they're like, oh, I want to pick up a few extra classes, and there is a, a class on on a particular book of the Bible or uh, church history or so those are available to them, uh, even mm-hmm. though that's not their, uh, de- their focus degree. What, what percent then would you say, uh, you know, if there's 10 students at the, uh, the Bible colleges, um, so any of them, not just the one you went to, how many yeah. of them go into full-time missionary work? Ah, oh, good question. Um, 
it really depends on wh- what Bible Bible college. Yeah, I would say pretty few. Uh, there's a far higher percentage that end up um, in like a pastor or some sort of a full-time church. As far as actual missionaries, pretty few. Um, I would say in our, it, we, mine was a very tiny Bible college, about 200 students. Really mm-hmm. tiny. You got to know everyone. It was awesome. Um, couldn't hide. Uh, yeah. But out of, out of the 200, I would say maybe, maybe 10, 10 to 15, they actually end up in missions. Okay. So yeah, less than 10%. So quite a few, yeah, yeah. but you were mentioning, uh, it seems like the vocations people choose when they're entering or in the part of Bible college tend to be sort of human related occupations, right? Like nursing, yeah, kind of teaching. typical secular jobs. Yeah. And then so you finish your Gifu, you're at a public school. And as a teacher myself, I'm, I'm very interested to hear, uh, what, what, what were Gifu public schools like? Cause I, have- yeah. So the, um, I was, part of a, um, it was a smaller, smaller city, about 60,000, um, about eh, maybe a 20 minute drive south of, of downtown Gifu. So it was a little bit more country kind of setting, even then from, from Gifu city itself. It's a good question. It's kind of a little bit difficult to answer, like what's it like, but I think, I mean, Japanese schooling, it just in itself is already so different than international and American schools. But, Mm -hmm. uh, just very structured. I think just, I mean, again, just Japanese schools is very structured, very orderly. This is how they do things. Um, there's even in the country school, there's, there's a variety. There are schools that were really fun, easy to work with. And then there are some terror schools where um, you went and as, as a friend put it, you kind of do more zookeeping than you do actually teaching um, mm. or they're just like, these kids are out of control. Um, uh but the majority of the time they were really fun to work with and I really enjoyed working with them, enjoyed working with the, the teachers. So um, I'm just thinking, for example, when it comes to um, things like infrastructure and when it comes to curriculum, um, mm. how, how, how was it uh, different from CAJ? Again, I think the word that comes to mind is structure. I feel like CAJ, I mean, obviously it has, it has you know, any good school is going to have structure, but there's a lot more... There's a lot more freedom, more freedom to speak your mind. There's more freedom to, to kind of explore. Um, there's a lot more kind of interaction going on. That's just, that's something that uh, certainly for America, that's something that they value. And CAJ also based on American principles, uh, the school system based on an American system. And so there's just a lot that's valued and kind of instilled from very early on. Whereas in the Japanese school, even the... It's it's fun because they would really try hard to get students to share their mind, but the way they do it is so structured mm-hmm. that all they're doing is spitting out the you know the expected answer, um, or it's like okay, we want every student to raise their hand, and we're not going to move on until every student's hand is raised to give an answer. Sounds terrible. You know, and it's like that, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh... I even had a teacher ask me like, how how do Americans how how do you teach like independence how do you teach you know Mm. students to think for themselves and the best answer i could give is that it is taught but it's more like from the earliest stages we're modeling and teaching and encouraging it so that by the time they get to the schools it's already part of who they are and Mm. then just every the entire system runs that way whereas in japan it's a system i mean you know this in, in japan it's very it's like Hey everyone, this is how it's done, and everyone follows suit. That's why during this COVID time, every, the government doesn't even have to mandate anything. They just say, "Please do this," and everyone goes, "Okay," for the most part. And um, uh, kind of the same thing in the schools. So even when they try to encourage, uh, think for yourself, it's done in such a structured, formatted way. As you said, yeah, I guess some silver lining is like with the you know the masks, but yeah, you're right with the think for yourself, but the way we want you to maybe <laughs> sort of. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's pros and cons. Yeah. I see that in the States and Japan, there's, there's pros and cons yeah. to both. And uh, I think we have a lot to learn from each other that way. So, so um, speaking of schools, you're a CAJ lifer K to 12. So yep. talking about oh, 13 years and um, do you guys have a, a pre-K or is it start, no. start a K? Starts okay, at K. So. Yeah. You max it out 13 years. <laughs> what would you say is um, the main strength 
as well as sort of the main weaknesses of the school. And I mean, obviously, I, I say weaknesses with the assumption that every school, even you know, the mm-hmm. best schools in the world, yeah. do have yeah. things they can work on. Whew. Wow, that's a loaded question there. So first of all, I, I didn't max 13. I actually, you could almost say I maxed 19 or 18 because the first six years of my life, I lived on a, on campus staff housing. So, so yeah, I, I've been at, I was actually at CJ even longer. Um, wow. Yeah, it, it was interesting. Uh, I knew the staff, you know, by name before I went to kindergarten. Definitely, like you said, every school has, has them. Um, obviously, some of that, um, some of this is going to be uh, influenced by my own my own faith as a Christian, but I do feel that one of the strengths of Christian Academy is because they are a Christian school based on the, on Christian foundation the, from the Bible. Uh, there is a moral standard by which everyone is expected to live by, and it's not just simply taught externally, but the majority of homes are homes that also value the same moral standard. Um, And so as a result, um, by no means is there, you know, the students perfect or anything, you know, far from it. Uh, We have all kinds of problems that any school has, but, um, but in the, in the students themselves, there is a certain expectation of this is acceptable and this is not. Um, I feel like that's one of the strengths um, in, in CAJ is just that kind of moral base. One of the things, another completely Aside from that, that I really sensed a lot growing up, going to CAJ is kind of a community feel. It helps that we're a smaller school. And uh, I think right now it's one of, that's a little over 400, which is on the larger side. Uh, mm-hmm. I think when I was there, we were a little under. Um, like my, my class, my graduating class was 50. And um, in elementary, it's typical to have 20. And it's just one class. It's not split. Um, and so just the, the community, um, app is not just the classes, but just the whole of, of parents and whatnot. And again, I can't speak for other international schools, just speaking for CAJ caught me a little off guard with that question. It's, it's a good question. Um, weaknesses at CAJ. Um, I think if I had to say, uh, one weakness, um, I would say that I think in recent decades, one of the things that, um, Again, depending on who you talk to, might be they might see this as a as a good thing. But I feel like CAJ has kind of turned a little bit into almost a prep school. And there's there's obviously good things about prep schools, but in the sense of just I, I feel like there's been a a lot more intensity um, of pressure on students. Some some of that's self inflicted. Some of it is you know coming from parents. But just in general, kind of a kind of, you know, as things spiral, either spiral upward, spiral downward, you know, of just pressure and expectations of feeling like I need to do this. I need to be involved um, in everything that I can be involved in. Um, being a smaller school, it's, you have a higher likelihood, for example, of get, getting onto the team. But then that also means you try to be on the team and you try to be in band and you try to be on taking all these tons of AP classes and, and you're trying to do all these things because you can do all those things as opposed to, well, I can't get into this and I didn't make this and I didn't make this, but I can thrive on one thing. And so sometimes the ability to do everything, you feel the pressure to do everything and, and then you end up with burnout. And so a lot of kids feeling the pressure to take as many AP classes as they can only to find out that they only needed one of them or none of them when they actually went to college. And that's an area that I feel is kind of, it's it's done then it's kind of sad so when it when it comes to strength i I completely concur with you sort of that um i don't know if moral would be the right word because obviously i don't can't really know someone's morality but um (laughs) aj students always had a reputation of being very just nice you know nice and kind especially when it comes to sports meetings there's always the caj kids you know putting away the garbage i'm glad to hear that (laughs) i'm sure you, you probably recall that that was sort of the general the general yeah. atmosphere, you know. But, but I'm biased. So, you know, it's nice hearing that from someone from another school. Yeah, and, and I, I do, I do uh, definitely concur with that sense of community. Um, one thing that um, I always felt jealous about, obviously, I was going back, I know I mentioned it already, but I'm not religious at all, right? You guys, before sure. track, before the four by four and four by yeah. one, we both ran in track, right? And I did yeah. the four yeah. four. You guys would always have the baton, and there'd be like this 
prayer, like four people would be together. And we would just yeah. kind of be like looking and being like, man, we want to kind of do something like, like similar, <laughs> but we're not religious. So, so we would just kind of give each other high fives and like psych each other right. up. But yeah, I, there's definitely that, that sense of community and, and CJ mm. has that reputation of just very friendly, um, you know, just not, not only the, the students, but the parents as well. Mm. And um, in regards to, you know, the negative of becoming a prep school, I, I think that's a trend I see worldwide, though, as well as all the international schools in Tokyo. I, I agree with you that mental health seems to be taking the back seat, And um, it seems like, you know, sort of the prover- proverbial, you know, rat race as adults as actually sort of begin to seep into life as a high schooler where you have kids essentially doing volunteer work for you know, college applications, which I find just very, I feel ethically immoral, mm. but it's or at least questionable at the least. Yeah, yeah, the very least questionable. And yet that's actually almost the norm now, you know, where there's a mm. lot of, there's of course, definitely students who do it for the right reasons, but mm. there's also students who do it for the wrong reasons. So that's interesting yeah. to hear that. Um, that's a trend uh, CAJ is going through as well. Um, so we've talked a bit about, you know, your work, we've talked a bit about CAJ and I like to conclude if you've seen any of the podcasts maybe you've seen one uh, where I asked the guests sort of what's coming up uh, in the next few years next few decades so um, if you want to take it away just tell us what, what's on the horizons really when I look on the horizon I see myself doing the exact same thing I'm doing now as far as just working with the no place left network working with churches trying to share with as many people the the gospel of Jesus I think if I were to so a lot of what I see on the horizon is, is as it were, vision, a vision of what I believe God wants to do, um, what I'm believing in faith that he's going to do. Um, so I guess that what I'm seeing on the horizon is even just in a few years time, there's right now doing, there's kind of a lot of um, stuff on my own in the sense of like, I got a little bit of help here and a little bit of help here, but kind of feeling a little bit alone. Um, but already starting to see a little more traction, already starting to see more, more of not just work with other foreigners, other missionaries, but actually work with other Japanese, not just, and not just pastors, but also just average Japanese who are just working a regular job or one guy who's right now currently looking for a job and, and, um, and seeing more and more and more of the, the church dynamic in the Gifu area, but beyond that as well, looking more and more Japanese-led, Japanese-empowered, and the outreach being, being led by, motivated by the Japanese themselves rather than kind of encouraged from the outside. So as far as me and my family, we see ourselves still in the Gifu area, and, um, but shifting more and more to a uh, maybe a kind of a counseling role of just saying, where they come and say, hey, I've got a, you know, I want some help in this area rather than doing a lot of the grunt work myself, but finding myself more and more in the position of, of helping and aiding and, and helping people discover the solutions for themselves. If that makes sense, that's kind, of, that's kind of where we see ourselves. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for being the first guest on the fourth season, where we're on episode right. 31. Wow. <laughs> and third CAJ guest, so that's a lot of, a lot of CAJers. Um, and I need to get some YS and say more. Um, so if, if you know any people from the Yokohama <laughs> All right. school, All right. they can help me out. And um, yeah, it was, it was good catching up, and I uh, wish you best of luck. All right. Thanks so much, Nick. Thank you.